Hello, my commercial law students. Uh, in this episode of commercial law, we're going to be looking at the shelter rule, as well as the difference between real and personal defenses and how they hold up against the holder in due course. And then finally, we will talk briefly about uh, the interesting issue of what are the legal effects of the forgery of the maker signature or the drawer signature, the person who issues the instrument. What if that signature is forged? We've talked about forgery with respect to the forgery of an endorsement and how that will prevent anyone from becoming a holder, let alone a holder in due course. Uh, but this is a different type of forgery, but more on that later. Let's turn first to the shelter rule. And um, <clears throat> here's our textbook. And the shelter rule, as I have mentioned before, is a stems from an ancient concept, legal concept, that you should be able to transfer all the rights that you have. And if you transfer with the intent to transfer all of your rights, all of the rights that you have with respect to an item uh, should go along with it. And so when a holder in due course transfers a, an instrument to someone who isn't in their own right, won't qualify as a holder in due course, for example, if it's a gift, um, that transferee will nevertheless inherit all the rights of the transferor. Therefore, will inherit all the rights of a holder in due course. It may seem particularly generous. It may seem to undermine the whole purpose of being a holder in due course. If you can get rights of a holder in due course without becoming a holder in due course, um, but it is something that actually increases the stability and the reliability of a, of a promissory note or a check, a draft, because the holder, the person, that, the transferee, whoever comes into possession, purchases a note or is given a note or a check, has greater certainty that he or she will be able to enforce it because he knows now that, hey, even if I'm not a holder in due course, I'm going to get the rights of a holder in due course because the seller, the person who gave it to me, transferred it to me, um, whether there's a sale or not, he or she was a holder in due course, and under the shelter rule, I get their rights. That's how it works. Let's look at the law. It is uh, Article 3, 203, transfer of instrument, and the rights acquired upon transfer. And... Um, First, there's a definition here of what transfer means. It's not any kind of um, uh, change of possession, but it, is, it also requires intent. Uh, so transfer is when the instrument is delivered by a person other than its issuer, that is the original payee or subsequent holder. Uh, an instrument is transferred when it's delivered by a person other than its issuer for the purpose of giving to the person receiving delivery the right to enforce the instrument. So if you're giving it to someone for purposes of enforcement, like here, sweetie, then happy birthday, and you give her a promissory note that's made out to me, um, you know, I'm giving that to her with the intent that she's going to enforce it and get the thousand dollars, whatever it's made out for. Um, but if I give it to her just to go and put in my filing cabinet, that's not a transfer. And so she doesn't, she won't inherit any of my rights. So keep that in mind. Okay, back to the law. Now the, the shelter rule itself. If you do conduct a transfer, you give it to another person with the intent that they should enforce it, well... Transfer of an instrument. This is now the legal effect of such a transfer. Transfer of an instrument, whether or not it's a negotiation, so even if it's not a negotiation, vests in the transferee any right of the transferor to enforce the instrument, including any rights as a holder in due course. But you cannot benefit, of course, from the shelter rule. The transferee cannot acquire the rights of a holder in due course if the transferee engaged in fraud or illegality affecting the instrument. So, clearly, if, if you are involved in some kind of fraud and illegality, if you're trying to manipulate the system to benefit from the shelter rule, um, then you're not going to be able to get the ho holder in due course rights. And that's only fair, and I think just the application of the requirement of uh, good faith 
in the UCC you would reach the same result. No judge would give a criminal the benefit of the UCC. Okay, so that's it. So if you transfer, if you give it to someone else, um, even if it's not a negotiation, you can benefit from the shelter rule. So how might it not be a negotiation? I mean, you might be a holder in due course, and it's a order paper made specially out to you from the previous holder, uh, and you sell it to someone with the intent that they will be able to enforce it, uh, but you don't endorse it. So it's not a proper negotiation. But nevertheless, it's a transfer, and even though it's not a proper negotiation, that transferee is going to get your rights as a holder in due course. Pretty neat, huh? Let's do some problems. Yes, yes, yes. Problem 123, 124, and 125 are all part of one long story. And uh, uh, there are a lot of characters, um, but let me read it through here, and then we'll, we'll take it on piece by piece. So, Happy Jack, used car salesman, uh, sold Manny a lemon car for his business, taking in payment a promissory note for $2,000 made payable to the order of Happy Jack. Okay, so he sold Manny a, a car. I wish it would turn off this highlighting. There we go. Go. All right, I want to highlight, but not permanently. All right, so he sold the car to Manny um, for $2,000, gave him a promissory note. Jack then, Happy Jack, discounted the note with Alfred, a local money broker. We paid him seventeen hundred bucks for the discount. Uh, I took the note without knowledge of the underlying transaction. Okay, so what does this look like so far? This looks like he would be a holder in due course because he there's nothing wrong with the note on its face. He gave money for it seventeen hundred, and he has no knowledge of any problems with it. Include most importantly, has no knowledge that it was a lemon. If he knew that it was a lemon, then he'd be aware. Of, of a defense, and then Alfred could not become a holder in due course, but he's unaware, just what we like, blissfully unaware, so he becomes a holder in due course in his own right. Okay. Um, then Alfred, the holder in due course, Alfred's daughter, Jessica, had a birthday shortly thereafter, so Alfred endorsed the note in blank. Good. Uh, and gave it to her as a present. So, he endorsed the note in blank and gave it to her. That is a proper negotiation. So Jessica is a holder. All you have to do is uh, sign it, endorse it in blank, turn it into bearer paper, and then you transfer bearer paper. Transfer is a holder. Okay. Um, when the note matured, Manny refused to pay it to Jessica. The car had fallen apart, and he felt that he shouldn't have to pay for a pile of junk. Is Jessica a holder in due course? What is Jessica going to do? Of course, she had it, and she waited until it was mature. Then she goes to Manny, and he says, Hey, you're this um, Happy Jack sold me a lemon. I'm not going to pay on that note. That, as we'll see, uh, is a personal defense, not a real defense. And so um, the question is, is Jessica a holder in due course? We know she's a holder, but is she a holder in due course? If she's a holder in due course, then she's immune to these, this personal defense that the car sold was a lemon. And she will demand payment and get paid. But is she a holder in due course? No, of course not. Why? Because she's a donee. There was no value given. So she's not a holder in due course in her own right. However, the promissory note was transferred to her with the intent that she enforce it from her father Alfred, who was a holder in due course, and therefore, even though she's not a holder in due course in her own right, she has the rights of a holder in due course. I think that's a rather poetic way to put it. Um, okay, well that's 123. Let's uh, go on to this.
through this saga. Problem one, two, four. If in the above problem, Jessica had thereafter made a gift of the note to her husband, Lorenzo, would Lorenzo have holder and due course rights? And does it matter if Lorenzo, prior to the gift, knows of Manny's problems with the car? Hmm. If Manny won't pay, is Alfred liable to Lorenzo? Okay. So to make this a little easier to follow, because now we're dealing with some of five, six names, and there's going to be another one, I think. Um, I put this together. Just a little chart here. Uh, there's going to be Porsche Moot coming in the next in the next problem. So we had Manny issue the note to Happy Jack who negotiated it to Alfred who became a holder and a holder in due course who gave it to Jessica who became a holder and had the rights of a holder in due course and now Jessica gives it to Lorenzo. Is he a holder? Is he a holder in due course? Um, Remember, Alfred um, endorsed it in blank, so it's bearer paper. So when she hands it over to Lorenzo, uh, then he becomes a holder. And she's also transferred it to him with the intent that he enforce it. So he has whatever rights she has, which means he is now a holder. And though he's not a holder in due course in his own right, you know, because she gave it to him. There's no another donee. But she transferred it to him, and uh, he takes whatever rights she had, which are the rights of a holder in due course. So she's in the, he steps into the shoes of the transferee, which is really what this shelter rule is about. When you transfer something, the intent that the transferee should be able to enforce the instrument, the transferee steps into your shoes. Um, Okay, so Lorenzo. So he, we've decided what he is. Let's see what the questions are. Let's go back to that. That's not quite it. We've got a few windows open here. There we go. Um, yes. So would Lorenzo have holder and due course rights? Yes. Does it matter if Lorenzo, prior to the gift, knows of Manny's problems with the car? He's somehow, you know, it's a small town. It's like Cleveland and. Hey, he happens to know of Manny. Um, when he looks at the signature, oh, he, he told me he got that car he bought with this note was bad. Now that, which set off a red flag now, uh, does, that, does that change his status as someone with, a, with the rights of a holder in due course? And the answer is no. It would prevent him from becoming a holder in due course in his own right because then he would be aware of a defense. So not only, he can't be a holder in due course in his own right because he didn't pay, didn't give value, and he's aware of a, of a defense. So he certainly cannot become a holder in due course in his own right, but he can still benefit from the shelter rule. Under the shelter rule, there's not a, uh, it's not the same test. You don't have to give value. You don't have to be blissfully ignorant of any defense. There just has to be a transfer with an intent that you will be able to enforce it. And hey, if you're transferee and you holder in due course rights, you will, even if you are aware of a defense. Isn't that great? There is one limitation if you go back and look at 203B in the final phrase. It says, but any transferee shall not become, shall not receive the rights of a holder in due course if they're engaged in fraud or, fraud or illegality. But Lorenzo's mere knowledge that the car was a heap of junk that doesn't rise to fraud. He's not engaged in fraud. Lorenzo's not engaged in illegality. He just knows that, hey, his buddy has a, a lemon. So, I hope this is clear. It's a little intellectually challenging, but it's also... Uh, the rules are clear and consistent. But um, if you have any questions, of course, hit me up with emails. Come to my office hours. Let's move on. I think we're done with um, 124. Now 125, Porsche Moot comes into the equation. 
After Lorenzo, <clears throat> after Lorenzo, from the last problem acquired, the note he sold it for 1800 bucks to Portia, the local attorney. Okay. She had no notice of problems with the instrument. When she presented it to Manny for payment, he refused to pay and instead filed for bankruptcy. May she recover from Alfred. Now, I think this, uh, this uh, problem is a little unfair because um, it's really not about the shelter rule so much. Now, this is about um, uh, the rights to, to sue an endorser, etc. But uh, let's work through it. Um, one thing, I think the, the first issue, I think this is the most important, is uh, the issue of bankruptcy. Um, and that Portia Moot was not able to recover from uh, Manny because he was bankrupt. He was judged bankrupt. And that goes to real defenses, as we'll see. Uh, bankruptcy, discharge and bankruptcy, is a real defense. And Portia Moot, now, I'll we'll look back at the uh, chart here. Portia Moot purchased uh, the note. Uh, from Lorenzo. So is she a holder in due course? Is she a holder? Let's see. He, had a, he was a holder of this note, which was endorsed in blank, and he negotiated it to Portia Mood, who gave value for it, and she's blissfully unaware of any problems, so she's actually a holder in due course in her own right. Wow, terrific. So she's a holder in due course. She sues Manny. Uh, Manny raises a defense of bankruptcy, which is a real defense, so he wins. He's dissolved of liability. Um, and so, now, as you know, she can sue any endorser's liability, which is secondary liability, triggered upon dishonor by the maker of the note. She can choose anyone who signed the instrument. And who signed the instrument? Happy Jack and Alfred. So he can sue Alfred under endorser's liability as a holder in due course. Yes. So the answer is yes. May she recover from Alfred? Yes. And 3303B just points us to the fact that bankruptcy is a real defense. Okay. If she does sue uh, Alfred and prevails, Alfred will reacquire the instrument. That's how it goes. Uh, if you sue on an instrument, you say, Alfred, I'm going to sue you, pay on this instrument, and then he'll pay you, because he doesn't have a good defense against the holder in due course. He wasn't judged bankrupt. So he'll have to pay you, but you give him the note, and he reacquires it, and then he sees if he can go and sue someone else on the note. And you don't want the note anymore, you got your money. So that's how it goes, and um, you know he'll go and see if there's another endorser that he can sue, and there is, Happy Jack. Um, but let's see where we were. Yes, he reacquires the instrument. Does the shelter rule give him Portia's holder in due course rights? Does Alfred reacquire his original holder in due course status when he gets the instrument back? Could he sue Jessica or Lorenzo? See the following discussion? Okay, it's really coming to a head now. Um, and let me short circuit things a bit, tie it together. So when Portia Moot does sue Alfred and wins, because she's holding in due course, hands him the note, he reacquires the note. And when you reacquire a note in this type of event, you reacquire your original status. You can act as if the note, as if it were the day, the moment when the note first came into your hands, when Alfred first purchased it from Happy Jack means he reacquires his holder in due course status. Now if there are other um, signatures on the note, he can strike out all the other signatures as if they never happened. So for example, uh, Alfred could strike out his own signature. Not that that would have any benefit, but the point is, is that he could kind of nullify everything that happened afterwards and step back in time to that pure 
place in time when he was an innocent acquirer of what appeared to be a you know, perfectly good promissory note. And it, it is a perfectly good promissory note. There's just this um, personal defense of selling a lemon that's lurking in the background. Okay, so let us look back at the law to show you that um, what I just stated is actually the fact. And uh, 3207 is where we're going. Clean that up a bit. 3207. There we are. Reacquisition. Reacquisition of an instrument occurs if it's transferred to a former holder by neg negotiation or otherwise. So uh, Portia Moot gave it back to him with the intent that if he wants to go ahead and enforce it, he's welcome to. Uh, it doesn't have to be a negotiation, so it doesn't matter. Uh, either by transfer or negotiation, as long as there's an intent that you should have the right to enforce it. Upon reacquisition, former holder who reacquires the instrument may cancel endorsements made after the reacquirer first became the holder of the instrument. Um, so, let's, uh, as far as we need to read at this moment, um, so the, uh, the answer at the end of the day, does Alfred reacquire his original holder in due course status? Yes, he becomes an actual holder in due course. And can he sue then Jessica or Lorenzo? Well, let's look at the, the chain of events here. Uh, so it's uh, Alfred now who becomes a holder in due course. Can he sue Jessica or Lorenzo? No. Right? He is in a, a position now. First of all, there's, there's no, the only possible, um, you know, one of the, the few possible legal theories would be endorser's liability, and neither Jessica nor Lorenzo endorsed the, the note because it was bearer paper. They just transferred it. So there is no basis. But in any event, the important point is that we act now after Alfred uh, uh, reacquires it, as if none of these people ever exist. They're out of the picture. But Alfred can sue Happy Jack under endorser's liability since he is now uh, an endorser subsequent to Happy Jack who had, was forced to pay on the instrument to Portia Moot. So, um, I hope that makes some sense. Um, good thing about uh, video lectures is you can Zip right back and rewind it and listen to it again, and, and uh, hopefully it becomes clear a second time, <clears throat> if not the first. So now let's go to a, a case, um, the Triffin case, which again is an illustration uh, in case form of the shelter rule. Here we have uh, the Hauser Corporation. Their, <clears throat> their checks were stolen. 18 checks at least, um, stolen by someone, and they were already signed by Hauser. They were signed by a facsimile um, signing machine. They were printed signatures on blank checks, basically. And someone got in and stole the blank checks, and then went around and um, you know, cashed them all over town to, to multiple different uh, check cashing agencies uh, and then those check cashing agencies in the meantime let's say in the meantime uh, Hauser was aware of the theft and placed stop payment orders on those checks and there were twenty five thousand dollars in all it's a, kind of the total figure we're talking about that was stolen and he placed stop order um, stop order stop payment orders on these checks and his bank uh, complied with the stop payment orders and dishonored the checks, which is great. So Hauser seems to have been saved from from this uh, terrible theft. Now, so the checks were not paid out of his account, but in the meantime, when they were dishonored uh, and returned to these check cashing agencies, um, they took them and sold them to this uh, company Triffin. Triffin's in the business of buying distressed debt. 
dishonored debt. Because they know that, hey, it was dishonored. Maybe we won't be able to collect on any of it, but hey, maybe we'll be able to sue an endorser. Or maybe the maker will come back into the chip someday. Or, you know, so we discount it appropriately. We're not going to pay much for this distressed debt. Pennies on the dollar, but we'll pay it. Now, so that's what Triffin did and bought all of these dishonored checks. And now Triffin wants to go and enforce them against Hauser because under Maker's, uh, as we'll see, Drawer's liability, right? We'll see Drawer's liability is secondary liability. If the bank dishonors a check, he can go and sue the drawer, and that's exactly what Triffin is doing. And, and then what does uh, Hauser say? You're not a holder in due course. These were stolen checks, and you're not a holder in due course, so you're subject to my personal def defense that these are stolen, my property right. Give those back to me. You cannot enforce those. Um, and it's true that Triffin is not a holder in due course because they were marked dishonored. And if they've been previously dishonored, it says right there in, in uh, 3305 that a notice of a dishonor of a check prevents you from becoming a holder in due course. But the catch is the shelter rule and the reacquisition rule. When the dishonored bank, when the bank dishonored the checks, it transferred them back to these check cashing agencies who reacquired these checks and were able to strike everything that, you know, conceptually, for their status, were able to strike everything that happened and reacquire their original status of holder in due course. And then they transferred, they sold these uh, checks to Triffin. And so Triffin, even though it's not a holder in due course in its own right, because it does see the, the uh, dishonor stamp on these checks, uh, is a transferee from a holder in due course and therefore has rights of a holder in due course and can sue Hauser and Hauser cannot successfully raise this personal defense of theft or a property claim because the uh, holder in due course or someone with the rights of a holder in due course is immune to those defenses. So Hauser has to pay. Is this fair? Well, I, I guess the argument that this is fair is that Hauser was not smart, negligent, you might say, in leaving signed blank checks around. So I think that is argument that's made that, that makes it uh, seem a little more just, but you know, you can certainly have arguments on that policy. In the following video, we'll get to the issue of real defenses, but I think you now understand uh, the concept of the shelter rule, so this segment is closed, and uh, on real defenses.